Welcome everybody to our Crossref hosted webinar about where does publisher metadata go and how is it used. My name is Nora Wilkinson and I'm the Education Manager at Crossref. I warmly welcome you to this webinar. The session is being recorded and you will have a link sent to you after the webinar so that you can listen to it again and also that be made available to people who registered but weren't able to attend so they can catch up with it too. I'd like to start by introducing our speakers today. We have uh, a wide number of people participating. We have Stephanie Dawson from Science Open, Pierre Mounier, who has a number of different hats at Operas, at Open Edition, and also on the Hermios project. I've already introduced myself, and also joining me are my colleagues, Anna and Shane from Crossref. I've put everybody on mute for the time being, um, but there will be time for you to ask questions at the end. And also please feel free to submit questions via the chat during the presentations. Thanks again for joining us and I'll hand over to Stephanie. Okay, hi, thanks very much for this opportunity to talk about metadata and to tell you a little bit about um, the work we're doing at Science Open. Um, I want to start with a question, um, and that is how much discoverability do you think that you're getting for your Crossref DOI? Um, if you think about Crossref as marketing spend, what is that return on investment? And I ask that specifically because I know I worked at a, um, the publisher, mm -hmm. De Gruyter, for... Yes? I can't see your slides. Can oh, you can't see my slides. Let me... Uh, Okay, let me try again. Great. And that's lovely. Thank you. Are we back there? <laughs> um, great. I can just go back so you can see my uh, contact information here. Um, so I worked for many years at a, um, a traditional legacy publisher, and I know that. Um, the people in charge of uh, Crossref were usually in the technical um, uh, department and m not so much in the marketing department. And I want to really try and rethink um, how publishers are interacting with Crossref because Science Open provides really a unique um, uh, op uh, opportunity to see your metadata in action and really start rethinking what you're doing at, um, with your Crossref deposits. So Science Open is a freely accessible, interactive um, search and discovery platform. Our business model is based on providing technology solutions and context marketing for publishers. Um, our platform is built um, it's currently, we're currently tracking 45 million research article records and preprints and about adding about 1 million um, article records per month. The platform is really built around a core of open access articles that are um, where we have access to the full text. So we get those from PubMed Central, from Archive, from um, Cielo and directly from publishers that we work with, um, where we can then um, get uh, the information about the references, extract that from those papers. We then do a lookup in our own system. Have we seen that article before? Or we do a lookup at Crossref or at PubMed and pull in um, more metadata for those um, articles. So uh, from that core of open access research, we can really expand that to show um, a whole cloud of connectivity around that, um, around that content to the tune of 45 million um, research records. Um, but that, of course, opens the uh, question of how do you make sense of 45 million articles? How do you find the relevant content? And as we um, continue to publish at an ever-increasing rate, this is a problem that everybody is trying to deal with. Um, so, of course, computers are <laughs> our friends in dealing with big volumes. Um, on Science Open, we work with a whole series of filters and sorting mechanisms to support our users. So, you can sort by open access, you can sort by preprint, 
um, date, you can um, search by affiliation, ORCID ID, keywords, abstract, etc. And you can then sort your results by altmetric score, by citation number, by date, by usage on the platform. So with those, um, with those sorting mechanisms, you really can ask very different questions and more interesting questions than you can ask uh, of Google Scholar, for example. Um, but of course, um, we are only as good as the um, data that goes into our system. So for example, if your content is not um, tagging the license information with the metadata of that article and you have an open access article, it won't get found, for example, with our open access fil filter. Um, if you're not adding affiliation data to Crossref, um, then a search for Harvard under affiliation won't turn up maybe your top paper. Um, the same thing goes for abstract. There's a lot of information in those abstracts that we can use to help promote similar articles, etc. So I want to talk today a little bit about the kind of metadata that you are um, providing us and what we're doing with it. So um, I'd just like to start with the topic of abstracts because it's that's really some interesting piece of information that, are, um, that you can now also get in your report from Crossref. Um, on Science Open, you can uh, do a general search. You can um, add a source filter and say, show me only the Crossref records. Um, those are records where we have done a validation of the Crossref DOI with Crossref. And now when somebody clicks on that article, and wants to read that paper, you get redirected from Crossref to the URL that you have deposited there. Um, and you can then ask, oh, how many of those have abstracts? This can give you a pretty good idea of um, the, the level of um, abstract, um, the number of abstracts that you are depositing. This may also be sometimes we um, pull in abstracts from other, from other sources, um, but it still is a pretty good, um, it still gives you a pretty good uh, general uh, feeling for the level of your metadata. Um, here's an example. Oh, uh, I skipped right here. Um, here's an example from a, uh, uh, an article that is adding um, uh, abstracts. So <clears throat> uh, from Pensoft publishers, we um, talked to them and said, you know, look, this is what your data looks like that's not being picked up um, via PubMed Central. You could really enrich that by adding abstracts. And so they're now um, uh, with all new articles adding that information onto um, Crossref and we're picking that up in Science Open. And you can see here across the top, the article usage um, and interactivity um, uh, metrics. So it's been viewed, um, it has one recommendation, it's been shared and it's been added to one Science Open um, collection. Um, another piece of metadata that can be really in, really important um, for driving traffic to your content is the, um, the references that you deposit with Crossref. And with the initiative for um, uh, open citations, the I4OC, we saw um, a, a big jump from 1% of the publications with open reference to now um, 50%, um, over 50% of the um, records that we pulled on today have references attached to them. What that means for Science Open is when we um, index your article and it has references with it, we do again a DOI lookup for all of those references um, that we can find. We, about 50% of those themselves have references, so we continue to pull in more and more references. So aggregating a single article can pull down thousands of articles in really a contextual cloud around that, showing where things are, um, uh, where things are um, connected. So here's an example of, a, of an article where the Crossref metadata includes um, references from Wiley, also a member of the I4OC um, initiative. And if you look across the top bar, you can see how many references we are um, picking up at Science Open. Um, but again, you can see this is an article that has this is an article that has no abstract. So the flag across the top says only um, record, but 
no abstract. Um, if I go, if I go back um, to an example where we have the full open access, full text XML, for example, Biomed Central, if you do a search on the, in the publisher view, you can see all of their content. Um, and uh, there you can see that we've had over 4 million views of those Biomed Central articles. We have, um, we ha have keywords, uh, affiliation information, abstracts, um, every kind of um, uh, tagged metadata that we can then use to promote that, um, promote that content uh, within the within the science open platform. So it really can um, uh, come uh, make up some uh, to some a substantial amount of, of views of your content. And that's always, we're always linking that back via a green button to the publisher website. So just to give you an, um, just to give you an idea, so we see roughly one and a half times more um, usage for articles that contain references. We see about five times more views um, for articles that have abstracts and about 10 times more views for articles that are, have been added to a science open collection. Um, and within collections, we see, uh, we can say we see about twice as much um, uh, usage for articles uh, if they're tagged as open access. Um, but we see about 10 times more uh, for articles that have references, and we see already 150 times more usage for articles that, um, that have abstracts. So we're, these are just some new numbers, and we're um, still playing around with this and need to get some, um, uh, uh, some more iterations before we really publish this. But just to give you an idea of how powerful that is having um, uh, your abstract information um, on Science Open. So um, what I would like to, the message that I would like to um, leave with you is really to think about what machines see when they read your content. And that's one of the great things that you can see on Science Open. You can really just go and explore what kind of metadata would we import from Crossref onto our platform. And I really would encourage everybody to consider depositing richer metadata at Crossref to get the most of your out of your DOI. You are spending a dollar per DOI. So um, if you think about that in terms of marketing spend, um, you can potentially get higher um, uh, return on that investment if you add all of the um, data that's possible. So I would just like to leave you with that um, message. And uh, as... Um, uh, Science Open, I would like to welcome everybody to look at your content on Science Open, get in touch with me. I would be happy to do a, uh, to, to go with it um, together with you and see where we can improve. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Stephanie. That's a powerful case study that you've presented to us there. Thank you. And Pierre, it's over to you next, please. Okay, thank you very much, Laura. Okay, so I will share my screen if I can. Okay. Is it okay? That's uh, great. Okay, so I can start. Uh, so my, my point of view, my contribution will be a little bit different from uh, Stephanie's because I will concentrate and focus on the question of, uh, of the metadata and particularly cross ref metadata to uh, uh, academic books, uh, which concerns mainly uh, humanities and social sciences. And I, for that, I will present some of the outcomes of uh, a current uh, 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 European project funded by the European Commission named HERMIUS. It stands for High Integration of Research Monographs in the European Open Science Infra Infrastructure. Uh, I will give you a, a, a short view on, on Hermius and a short presentation of Her Hermius program in a nutshell. And then I will concentrate on, on uh, three points, which is the implementation of uh, permanent, permanent identifiers on OA book platforms, uh, on uh, implementation of annotations, and the use of PIDs in metric service. Uh, to give you a general presentation of Hermia's project, the idea is very simple and it, uh, it goes from uh, uh, the, 
the analysis that uh, open access books are poorly integrated so far uh, or have been poorly integrated so far uh, in the um, in the scientific ecosystem or scientific information ecosystem because they lack mainly uh, the permanent identifiers that scientific articles have more than, uh, than the books. So the idea is to upgrade five open access books publishing platforms, OAPEN, uh, that you probably know, Open Edition Books, which is the platform I work with, uh, Ubiquity Press platform, the Göttingen University Press uh, platform from Germany, and the e-publishing uh, uh, platform uh, run by uh, EKT, uh, which is based in Greece. Um, uh, the idea is to coordinate those five uh, open, open access book publishing platforms. Um, uh, it, it represents more than 10,000 open access books. So it's, it's a lot of books. Uh, and to implement uh, in a coordinated way, five added value services on the platforms. You can see the list here. Uh, which is the implementation of uh, uh, identifiers such as DOIs, ORCID, and funding registry identifiers, uh, the uh, implementation of an entities recognition service uh, for uh, on the full text of the book, a certification service in partnership with the directory of open access books, and the implementation of an annotation service uh, in partnership with a hypothesis, and the implementation of a metric service based on open access metrics and alternative metrics. Uh, you see uh, the logos of the five platforms on the top of my uh, screen, but you see also uh, the, the, the partners, in fact, uh, which are providing uh, those integration, integration services that we, we are trying to connect to and in, to integrate into. Um, if you want to know more about, uh, because I don't have time, but if, if you want to know more about the project, you can see the, the URL of the project here. And inside it, you have a very nice video uh, made by our communication officer uh, to, to present the, the, the project as a whole. I just want now to, to, uh, to concentrate on the PIDs, implementation on PIDs through very simple and very concrete examples. So let's say that, for example, the implementation of DOIs uh, seamlessly on, on the, on the uh, open access book platforms and for the books and the book chapters improves considerably the cross-linking between content and the integration of books uh, into the scientific ecosystem. On the left side, you have uh, the, the title of an article uh, published in a journal uh, here. And on the left, left side, you have the bibliography of this article. And you can see that the, first ref the second reference of the, of the bibliography uh, cites a book which is published on one of our, uh, on our um, book platform. And you see here the DOI that gives a direct link to the book uh, online. And I just want to, that seems very simple and uh, almost uh, trivial, but I just want to, to put that in light with a very interesting article published, unfortunately uh, for some of you maybe uh, in French, but in, nonetheless it, it's interesting because uh, it states, uh, it's, a, it's based on a study that shows that there is a, a decrease in the citation of books uh, uh, compared to the citation of articles through time. And the two authors of the study, and you have the reference of the article there, uh, state that in fact it's the, the, the lack of accessibility and the lack of integration in the scientific ecosystem uh, for the book that uh, is the cause of this uh, uh, decrease of uh, citation of, the, of books uh, by scientists. So it's a, it's a trend that we want to counterbalance and fight back uh, by improving, in fact, the integration of books in, in this ecosystem. I give a, a second example of, about uh, PIDs, which is the attribution of ORCID IDs uh, to the authors of the book. And sorry for this uh, very egocentric uh, uh, example here, but that's the best example I have, uh, that I know at least. Uh, where you see I, I have directed a, a book which is published on Open Edition Book Platform and you see here uh, the, uh, the ORCID ID that I added uh, manually as an author uh, to reclaim the book on the platform. And then what, what is very interesting is that on the right side in my ORCID account, 
you can see that uh, the, uh, the, the last reference here in the list of my uh, publications is the book. So alongside the scientific articles, you can see the academic book of an author uh, in uh, its, uh, his uh, ORCID account. Uh, the last reference is, uh, for me, is uh, almost extraordinary because it's the addition of uh, the funding registry identifier uh, to books. Uh, here and here on the left side, you can see one uh, book uh, which has been funded by a joint uh, funding uh, scheme uh, between France and Brazil. And we have added uh, the identifier of uh, the, the funding agencies uh, to as a metadata to the book. And you can see here in Crossref that the book appears amongst uh, the articles which are funded uh, by the CAPTCH uh, in this case, which is the, the main uh, funding agency in Brazil. And that's very, very important because it improves recognition. Uh, of the work which is funded by, by funders uh, and it improves recognition, recognition of books where most of the, uh, of the work which, has, uh, which are uh, recognized are articles. Uh, I have not too much to, to show for uh, the two other services, the annotation and the metrics. Uh, but I just, uh, because we are in the, currently in implementation of those services, uh, I just want to, to say that for the annotation, uh, we are working in partnership with Hypothesis under the lead of Ubiquity Press, which is the, the work package leader uh, in the project on that. Ubiquity will offer a CDN to deliver HTML, PDF, and EPUB JavaScript files to the partners so that they can implement the latest version of those uh, JavaScript files uh, uh, on their platform. Uh, it relies also on the inclusion of DOIs in the HTML page header to be sure that the annotations are, are included in Crossref event data uh, service. And uh, the, the, the other important uh, information is that the annotation will be one of the metrics that we will implement in the next service. So I can switch to the next service, which is the metric service. Uh, this service will be uh, shared on two, uh, in two parts. Uh, the first one is uh, um, the provision of an open access metric service under the lead of uh, OBP. And another one, the other one is the uh, uh, provision of the alternative metric service under the lead of Ubiquity. All developments within Irmios are uh, open source, of course. So the uh, open access metric service will be based on DOIs and it will aggregate usage metrics from several platforms because the, the problem with uh, open access books is that they are disseminated on uh, several platforms. So it's very difficult for a publisher to uh, collect all the metrics from those different platforms. And that's what the service will, uh, will offer. Uh, the alternative metrics uh, will be based on DOIs as well. And it's, it's uh, developed on a modular structure based on drivers, which means that the service will be able to exp to expand to other uh, types of alternative metrics. And for the moment, which is, which is, what is planned is a driver for event data service, for Twitter, Facebook, hypothesis, of course, inclusion of annotations, as I said, as a metric, and Wikipedia. Uh, and all these metric service will be delivered as a single service through an API. Uh, I just want to, to, to end uh, with the challenges uh, that we face uh, uh, concerning the specificities of uh, the books using uh, metadata and standard metadata such as the PIDs. The, I go from the, from the, the less uh, difficult to the most difficult. Uh, the first one is a classical one, is the presence of multiple URLs for the same DOI, which is not easy to solve or to, to, to deal with, uh, for particularly for the metric service. But most, more difficult is the presence of multiple DOIs for the same book, because uh, through the different platforms and through different formats of the same book, you can have several DOIs attributed to the same book. And it's very, very difficult to link them back to the same book. Um, the other, another uh, difficulty or challenge is that uh, some platforms attribute DOIs 
by chapter and by book, and some others don't. So it's a little bit difficult to aggregate the DOIs at chapter level through the book level uh, and to, uh, to have, a, 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 let's say, a co uh, consistent information regarding a book based on these differences. And the most difficult, the most, the most important challenge that we have to face is the slow uptake in the SSH community of PIDs. Uh, not all, uh, of course, authors uh, claim their books or articles in SSH huh? uh, through their ORCID ID, and they don't even know uh, what is ORCID, for example. It's very difficult to explain to them what is a DOI and what is the benefit of have, uh, having uh, DOIs attributed to, to their book. They know ISB, ISBN, but uh, not, uh, all, uh, not always uh, DOIs. And uh, we'll see what, hap with wh what will happen with uh, open annotation on books and on metrics. But uh, it's an exciting challenge and uh, we, we are working on it. So thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much, Pierre. Would you please stop your screen sharing and I will switch yeah. to you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Can you see my slides all right? Yes. Great, thank you. So we've heard all about the many benefits of making your richer metadata available through Crossref. But how do we actually make this happen? Everything starts at content registration. This is how you deposit your metadata. And there are five different ways to achieving this. The first is the manual web deposit form, which some of you will be familiar with. And Fresh this autumn, this fall, is Metadata Manager, which is now in beta, it's now live. Both of these forms have something in common. They're a system where you enter manually information about the content you want to register, and the system turns it into XML for you in the background. The third method is the OJS Crossref plugin. You can also upload an XML file manually to our system. And if you're an API user, you can also use HTTPS to post XML via the API. So these are the ways that you actually register content. What is it that you're actually going to register or deposit with us? To start with, basic citation metadata. This is the classic bibliographic metadata that uh, most people think of spontaneously when they think about metadata to do with content, such as titles, author names, page numbers, ISSNs. But now increasingly, as we've heard from our two previous speakers, the additional non-bibliographic metadata is becoming important in its own right. For example, reference lists, license data, relationships between for example, a data set and an article or different versions of an article. You can also use Crossmark. This is an additional service through Crossref that you can use to notify readers about errata, retractions, updates, and more. And the golden rule with the metadata you deposit is to make sure that it's accurate, that it's clean, it has no mistakes in it, and that it's complete. And last but not least, really important to love your back files. When you decide to add additional metadata fields for current content, that's great, but don't forget to go back and add that information also for your back content to make sure that that's just as discoverable as your current content. So the takeaways here are that it's really important to update your metadata and remember that it's free. You can add additional fields for free. It doesn't cost you any extra. And the richer and more robust your metadata is, the more likely your content is to be discovered and disseminated because every bit of metadata that you add adds discovery and retrieval points for your content. So that's how you get your metadata into the system. Once it's in there, how do you know how well it's performing? And for this, I will hand over to my colleague, Anna. Thank you, Anna.
benefit Crossref, where my main role is to make sure that members are aware of all of the benefits that Crossref membership offers, and also to help members increase their participation. And by participation, I mean register as much and uh, richest metadata um, that they can. And today, I'm here to talk to you about our new tool called Participation Reports. So everything Crossref does is pretty much about metadata. So it will come as no surprise to you that participation reports are also all about metadata. So this symbol uh, for metadata is um, brackets, and then there are also elements contained in them, which we think are pretty important. So the elements are metadata elements that thousands of publishers submit to Crossref. Metadata helps link up many different outputs that researchers are using to help communicate with each other, communicate through data sharing, Twitter. So it's not just about the DOI and metadata record anymore. Uh, and we've been collecting more and more metadata elements. Uh, excuse me for a moment. Sorry, Anna, is it possible for you to speak a little more loudly, please? Sure, yes, I just, um, okay. I was just told Thank that you. it was loud enough. I apologize. Um, so we've been collecting more and more metadata um, over the years, and um, we, but we haven't done a good job telling our members how to deposit it and why it's important and beneficial to them. So we need a do, to do a better job educating everyone. So, um, so Crossref now has over 99 million, very close to 100 million content items. And by content items, I mean DOIs and associated metadata records. And lots of people are using that metadata. And how do we know this? Well, on average, we're seeing over 600 million metadata queries per month. And this is increasing every year. Uh, vast majority are through the REST API, but some are through our metadata search site. Uh, I don't know who a lot of them, we don't know who a lot of them are, but as we don't require any registration, but we do know some of them. So who uses Crossref metadata? Well, our members themselves, as well as other organizations they work with. We do know that systems such as these use our metadata. And if you go to our blog, we have a series of case studies of organizations using our REST API. I think we're up to 10 so far, and they include National Library of Sweden, um, Paperhive, and most recently, Kudos. So all of these systems, and also um, Pierre and Stephanie gave um, really good examples of how Crossref's metadata especially richer metadata is used on a daily basis. And can everyone still hear me or um, is it still a little? It's much better, Anna, thank you. Okay, perfect, sorry, I'm just gonna shut this off. Um, okay, so next up we have, um, so while these users have always ingested basic bibliographic metadata, they are increasingly looking to make use of richer and more complete metadata. So things like references, funding and license information, updates, and more information about authors for, from their ORCID IDs, for example. So many of you uh, present at this webinar deposit bibliographic metadata with Crossref, um, but we put a lot of effort into encouraging our members to send us additional metadata. And we found that when talking to members, a lot of them don't exactly know what metadata they submit to Crossref. And it, I know it's happened to me many times before, I would ask our members, um, are you depositing references, for example? And uh, more often than, than not, I would um, get the answer, I don't know. So until now, um, you could only get this information from our REST API, and this is an example of um, a list of uh, some of the elements that I'll be discussing uh, at this webinar today. So those digits are actually percentages of completeness. Uh, the list shown here has been openly available for each of our members for the past five years or so, um, but you do have to construct a URL query and then interpret the results. So it wasn't 
easy to accomplish for most of us. So we have built this tool, Participation Reports, um, so that everyone can clearly see what metadata we have and from who. Uh, it's been in production since June. It's a beta service, uh, been extensively tested, but we will be improving and adding to it. So if you use it um, and you've come across something that's um, a little strange, uh, please let us know because we will be um, improving this. And I will provide a, a link to this participation report so that everyone can, uh, can try it out. Um, so you can start by typing the name of the member uh, that you're looking for or your own organization. Um, you can suggest matches. Um, uh, it suggests matches and you can click on the, the member that you'd like to see. And you get to this page. This is the main page of the report. Um, looking at the info that the member has registered with us and a series of percentages indicating how much of their content contains particular metadata elements. And these elements are different for uh, different reasons, um, and I'll go, go through most of them um, in more detail. And the link uh, to the report is right below, so you can, you can look at it on your, uh, when you have some time. You may not have been able to see this on the previous slide, but there are filters that you can apply to this report. You can change content types. Um, it defaults to journal articles or to the content type that a member registers, um, but you can change it. Um, we have book chapters, book titles, conference proceedings, so you can, you can definitely change the content type. Uh, you can look up journal articles. So far, it's only journal articles by a specific title. So you can just search on a specific journal title. And you can change the date range. We have current content, which is the year that we are currently in, and two years prior to that. Uh, we have back file, which is everything prior to the current content. And we have all time selection as well. And I didn't mention, but at the top, the total registered content item number just shows how many uh, registered content items or DOIs have been registered since the beginning of um, the members um, uh, membership with Crossref. So first up, we have uh, references and open references. So references just means a percentage of content items that include reference lists in their metadata. And the open references actually re refers to the, the references, and it just means that they are set to be openly available for all Crossref APIs and services to, to um, query on them. So if they are not open, fewer people can see them. And you can open them quite easily. So if you do see a zero next to your uh, reference um, uh, in the report, let us know and we can uh, quickly open them up for you. And so why is this important to register references? Um, well, Pierre and Stephanie have mentioned uh, that a lot of that um, you know, helps with uh, drive, driving traffic to your content and helps with uh, your content's discoverability. Stephanie uh, mentioned I4OC, which I, I have here as well. Um, uh, it, basically, it allows researchers and the public to evaluate your research and its impacts to look for patterns of research communications. And uh, the Initiative for Open Citations is a collaboration between scholarly publishers, researchers, and others to promote unrestricted availability of scholarly citations in machine-readable form. And that's, that's the key, that it's machine-readable. Next up, we have funder registry IDs and funding award numbers. Um, funders are interested in funding data because it helps them integrate publisher metadata to help them track the outputs of the research researchers they fund um, and to make sure that they're sticking to their mandates with regards to publication, particularly if the results should be open access. Um, so it's really important to submit this um, metadata element um, you can uh, select the funder ID from our fun open funder registry, which we have made available, and you can also submit funding or um, grant numbers as well. So this is really important. And if you participate in Chorus, um, that's using Crossref metadata as well. Next up, we have ORCID IDs. Um, 
and these and Crossmark, which are somewhat related, uh, ORCID IDs um, are um, identi author identifiers, which help disambiguate author names. More publishers are using them and even requiring them. So please, if you are collecting them, please pass them on to us. And Crossmark is our um, uh, identification, identification service that will allow you to show that um, whether your content has changed since publication, um, they're somewhat related because um, deposited ORCIDs can be displayed as links in the Crossmark box. Um, the Crossmark um, will can also contain other elements that I'll be discussing um, uh, and that we're making available through participation reports like license information and um, additional information that the publisher chooses to surface. Um, so it's, it's really important to submit um, ORCIDs uh, and if you don't collect them, please start to ask for them. Next up, we have three sets of URLs. Um, these URLs um, you can also include as part of your metadata deposit, and they are used for different things. They can show where the full text is. They can show what you can do with the full text. Um, so for example, text mining URLs allow researchers to see where the full text link is that they can potentially access for text and data mining. Uh, license URLs uh, can include several different licenses. One can be for text mining as well. Um, so it can spell out what a researcher can do with um, you know, the, the full text URL um, uh, access and how they can mine the full text. Uh, other licenses are open access licenses, copyright licenses. So there's a variety that you can include. Um, similarity check URLs um, are basically let us know whether it's in the Authenticate, data, authenticate database and um, it allows Turnitin to um, index full text content um, and you do require them if you participate in similarity check. So you need to be over 90% uh, um, uh, at similarity check URLs. Okay, and I have a quote from Cynthia Hudson Vitali. She's a digital data librarian at Washington University who works with SHARE. She mentions um, items or aspects of metadata which some publishers provide but some don't, namely licensed metadata. Um, and this is exactly why we are asking our members for richer metadata um, because uh, there are a lot of different uses and it can show and help people decide what they can do. Uh, with the content that you publish. You can also look at the metadata registered by individual journals, as I mentioned, and also at different content types. This is a book chapter, and it uh, we only surface um, some of the metadata elements that you can register, so we would encourage you to register references for books, book chapters, as um, Pierre mentioned, it's really important. Um, you can also submit other uh, elements that I mentioned before, ORCIDs, license uh, information, cross marks even for different content types. And this is the page on our website that you links out from the, re uh, the report page themselves. It just shows you how everything works. It describes the elements that I mentioned in more detail, uh, why it's important to register the elements and um, how to do so, most importantly. And I included the link uh, there so you can um, uh, navigate to it later on. And uh, as I mentioned, participation reports have been in production since June. We just recently um, announced them to a wider community. They're open to all, um, so you can look up any member that's a Crossref member. Uh, we're looking for feedback and we do have future plans. So if you have any feedback or suggestions, let us know. And I will leave you with this. Um, use these reports to see where you can enrich your metadata to make sure your content is more useful for everyone. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Thanks, Anna. So in summary, we've heard about 
some of the things that you can do with your metadata. Where does it go? What services does it end up participating in and how it contributes to the discoverability and access to your content? Key to this is richer records, greater discoverability, greater linking and more touch points for people to discover and connect to your work. Content registration is how you get your metadata into the system in the first place. Five ways to do this, the manual web deposit form, metadata manager, the OJS Crossref plugin. You can also upload an XML file manually and you can post via the API. Participation reports that Anna just showed you show you how you're getting on. You've put all of this metadata into the system. How well is it performing? And improving your metadata richness means checking regularly to make sure that you've added clean, correct metadata for as many fields as you can and that you keep that metadata up to date. I'll finish with this slide here that gives you a visual representation of some of the many functions and systems that your metadata goes on to participate in and means that the work can be discovered and linked to and used by humans and by machines across such a wide variety of uses. I'll leave that there for you to look at while we conclude and we invite your questions. Um, my colleagues who have been looking at the chat, Shane in particular, can maybe update me on whether we've already got some questions that have come through that way. There are some questions in the um, in the both the Q and A and the chat. Um, I think there's a the outstanding question that I'm not able to answer because it is not related to Crossref is whether um, Science Open has a uh, API that can be used for like machine querying rather than um, a manual search interface. I can just answer that very briefly. It's something that we are working on, but um, it's not available at the moment. So we don't have a way for people to download um, information automatically from Science Open. Thank you. Rosa, shall I unmute people so that they can ask that way also? I mean, if you were able to unmute an individual, that would be better. I'll have to unshare my screen to allow me to see the controls. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Uh, William Roy has raised his hand. Let me just go through and give you talking permissions. William, please ask your, your question. Uh, Laura, is he muted? I have just unmuted him. Oh. <laughs> no question to ask at this time. Thanks, William. And Edelson had a question about the key features for metrics. Edelson, would you like me to unmute you so that you can ask your question? Let me just do that, just a moment. Okay, Edelson, you have talking permissions. Please go ahead. I think it would be better maybe to submit questions by um, the chat window or, or the Q&A. Sure, we can do that. Have. 
come. Sorry, Edison, I've just seen your message. Please go ahead and... Uh... Edison, your question was about key features for metrics. Would you be able to give just a bit more detail about your question so that we can decide who's the best person to answer it? And in the meantime, there was a question from John, which was, are there any plans to standardize affiliation information? We noticed significant variation in how affiliation data is rendered. Um, yes, that I, I can grab that question. That is um, one of the fields that we didn't surface in participation reports because of that um, uh, lack of standardization. Um, we hopefully will try to find a better way uh, but at this time, um, yeah, that was one of the reasons why we didn't include it in participation reports, but it is an important um, data and a lot of people are interested in it. If I could also just um, say to that point briefly, uh, the affiliation search that we have on Science Open is simply a text search. So it works well for uh, let's say if you're looking for Harvard, which is very, um, which is a relatively unique word, um, uh, University of, you can run into um, more difficulties. Nevertheless, it's still very, very interesting information that you can extract um, from that, even just from the plain text, even without having um, affiliations more um, structured and standardized. So I would recommend, you know, even if it's not um, at the highest level at the moment, still is worth putting that in there. And uh, if I may add something, uh, I should say that uh, it's almost, for me, from my perspective, it's almost a desperate, de uh, desperate attempt to try to uniformize uh, affiliation across the world, particularly because the higher education and uh, research systems are very different from uh, one country to another one. Uh, so, for example, in France, there was a standardization of affiliation declarations, uh, but it took a, a lot of time. Uh, but it works for France. And uh, as the French system is completely different from the American one, or the US one, for example, uh, it would be very difficult to uniformize uh, across the different countries. We have a few questions left in the Q&A from Anne. She asks, what, which types of metadata would you prioritize? I realize they are all important, but if you have to rank order, broadly speaking, it would follow what was on my slide earlier, that you have the basic bibliographic metadata first, and then the additional metadata. I'll be circulating those slides afterwards so that you can look at that in more detail. Uh, but unfortunately, Anne, your, your question kind of answers itself that they're all important. I would agree, um, and also um, I think if I had a list just for richer metadata, references would be my number one. Of course, opening them up if they're closed, and ORCIDs and license information. Thanks, Anna. We have a question, does Google Scholar, oh, sorry, that one's just been answered about does Google Scholar read Crossref metadata? And Shane has responded to that already in the Q&A. He says, we don't export data directly to Google or Google Scholar, but Google's web crawlers do index DOIs typically. So it ends up in there, even if not uh, directly. There's also a question from Amy. Do you recommend using XML workflow as standard? Um, Amy, do you mean uh, using a machine connection to deposit metadata as XML rather than a manual method? I think that's what your question is. Okay, thank you. Um, my understanding is that you can do more when you interact directly with the API, but on the other hand, if you don't have the technical setup in order to be able to use the API, then you can still achieve a lot by using one of the manual methods. And the important thing is to get your metadata into the system through the method that is appropriate for your circumstances. 
Okay, <laughs> thanks. Joanna has a question for Stephanie. How can I add individual journal to Science Open? Sorry. <laughs> um, so for, wait, can you hear me? Yes, yes thank you. Um, so uh, on an individual journal basis, um, we have a small fee that we charge publishers um, uh, to go through and check their metadata, get it in the best um, form and get it onto Science Open. So it's just um, reaching out to um, me or my colleagues and um, we can uh, look at the amount of data you have and make you a price. Thanks, Stephanie. Did we lose you? I think we may have lost Laura. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to mute myself. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, I was just about to draw things to a close, but in fact, we have a few more questions that have come through. Can somebody help me out with the question from Amy, please, about Onyx Feeds? Well, I think whatever um, feed um, you have, it needs to be transformed to the Crossref schema and XML. Um, perhaps Shane might be able to answer this one for us. I'm not familiar with a transformation uh, from from Onyx to Crossref schema. Um, we, and I guess, in terms of accessibility information, I don't think we capture that currently, but we're always making additions and improvements to the metadata schema. So um, I can definitely pass that as a suggestion uh, to our head of metadata. Shane, Amy's just posted a clarification there that her question was more about recording accessibility information in the Crossref schema. Yeah. Um, I, it's not, I don't believe that's something we currently are able to capture. Um, but it, let me, I'm going to double check on that. But. Is that partly because there isn't a standard way of recording it? Partly because the, uh, the legal requirements vary so much between different jurisdictions, for example. That, that could very well be. Um, but it's definitely a, 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 a like a schema um, improvement that I uh, I think we should at least seriously consider. Thanks for your question, Amy. Um, I also th we had a question about um, standardizing affiliation information, so I was wondering if if anyone uh, could speak to the ongoing. Um, sort of collaborative projects to create a uh, organizational identifier registry? Other than such a project is underway, I, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, 
I'm afraid uh, I don't know much more than that at the moment. John Chodaki did a, a post on the Crossref blog, I think at the beginning of August, as a kind of milestone saying that this group has now formed and their mission is clear. Uh, but as far as I recall, the blog post did not set out any concrete future date for anything. Uh, so other than stay tuned, Yes, and that crossref is involved as well. Um, it's one of the organizations that will be involved in helping develop an organizational identifier that will be open. It will uh, be similar to the funder uh, registry ID, um, or mm -hmm. it will be modeled on that, I think. Um, but yeah, stay tuned and we will let you know more as we know more. And thank you to Amanda, who's just posted that Data Site and California Digital Library are also involved. And from John, who mentions Kazrai, there are certainly lots of different people involved in this. And uh, I think they expected that things would start moving quite quickly once, once they had the setup of the group organised. So hopefully we'll have some uh, positive news from them soon. And I'm afraid we're up at the top of the hour already. <laughs> Thank you very much for all of your questions. If you have any other thoughts that uh, come to you, perhaps you will watch the recording or look at the slides again when we circulate them, please get in touch with us if you have any further questions. I'd like to thank you all very much for attending and especially to the people who have presented today, both Pierre and Stephanie, and also my colleagues from Crossref who have both presented and helped me out in the background with the technology and answering questions. Thanks again to everybody and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.